Good morning. Thanks to everyone for being here. I know it's, well, it's a little bit early, and yesterday was a big day. And I know we're running a little bit late, so I'm just going to kick right off. Um, I, and I will start us off with a quote. This is from one of the big um, kind of Silicon Valley, Valley analyst houses um, in the United States. And what they said is, to understand China's internet sector, you can start by thinking of a service that you know and love in, in the UK, in North America, in Germany. Most of the Western ones will do for this analogy. And then you change their names, you combine a bunch of them together, you drop any of the fees and most of the ads. And that's China. Um, and so you see statements like this, and you're like, well, right, okay, um, but why, right? And um, it's easy uh, at first glance to say, okay, well, maybe it's just a purely cultural thing. Lots of cultural differences that must have an impact, and it definitely does have an impact. Um, another thing that people often think of because we're talking about digital services is uh, internet penetration. And uh, in this map, you see the areas in dark red. Those are the ones with really high internet penetration, 80% and higher. And those are primarily developed economies. They tend to also be a lot of the countries that kind of kicked off the internet. Um, France, Germany, the United States, uh, that built a lot of the infrastructure in the early days. And then you add to that Japan and Korea, Singapore, Australia, and you've got the group with the highest mobile penetration. And then you look at emerging economies, and there the amounts vary, but it can be as low as you know 15% in places like India, Indonesia, and then various things along the way. And so this also does have an impact in why and how people do business on the internet. Um, the other factor that you probably think of is uh, income level. And this maps pretty well to what we saw in the previous one. In this case, um, it's the areas that are in blue, um, which are those countries with high internet penetration, and then in most cases, high income level as well. And um, the interesting thing to consider, though, is we still have about three and a half million people, or sorry, billion people, three and a half billion, who haven't yet used the internet, and they are all from countries where the um, income level is substantially lower. So all of these people will most likely come online using a mobile phone, uh, probably a low-cost mobile phone, anywhere from you know, $20 up to maybe, a, maybe $100, um, and uh, often an Android device. And so their, their way of interacting with the internet will probably be a little bit different just for that reason. So you look at all of these factors, but even when you combine them, they only tell a small part of the story. And so um, that's what we're going to talk about today, and in particular to do with commerce on the internet and uh, different business models, how people do business. And we're going to start by uh, looking at China. So China is really big, <laughs> needless to say. Um, it has uh, 14 cities with populations over 5 million. And it has an absolutely crazy 41 cities with populations of more than 2 million. Um, and these cities are just really fast growing. There's people coming into them all the time. And that really changes um, how people live, right? The, the middle class in China, um, based on analysts' expectations, or analysts' um, um, analysis, <laughs> the, the analysis of analysts um, is growing at a rate of about 80,000 people a day, right? So just constant change, constant number of people who all of a sudden have needs that they maybe didn't ha even have the month before, the year before, and all of a sudden there's things that they, things that they need to acquire, things that they want to do. And so um, as a brand, if you are trying to reach um, the rural population in China, which is often when people think about using the internet to reach people around the world, you often hear about saying, okay, well, the internet is really good to reach these kind of underserved populations, people in the countryside, people who normally wouldn't have access. And in China, that's about 600 million people, so it's a pretty big audience. Um, but what's equally challenging in China is actually reaching people in the cities. And, you know, there's about 700 million people, and the number is constantly growing. And so trying to actually open brick-and-mortar locations to, you know, distribute a brand throughout Chinese cities can also be um, very hard, very expensive. And so, you know, you kind of, you need another way. Um, and from the point of view of the Chinese consumer, what this means is that shopping online, you know, it's become that, not only the other way, it's become the way, right? It's not just an electronic version of um, brick and mortar infrastructure that we are used to over here in Europe and North America. It is commerce. It is how a lot of people do all sorts of things. Um, and the device that they do this with ends up being a mobile device. And there again, it's not just that mobile becomes the new thing that you slowly replace the old thing with. It is the primary and sometimes the only way uh, that people use the internet. And it, you know, it varies by person, but it is the primary source for many people. So um, Chinese e-commerce is also different um, in another really interesting and, and important way. 
If you look at uh, the way e-commerce works in North America and in most of Europe, um, Australia, very similar as well. You know, all, again, all those countries with high internet penetration, high income level. These are countries that have built up infrastructure over the years. They've built up brands. And so um, when you shop uh, in North America online, a lot of times you will go to individual retailers. Same thing in Germany. In the UK, you go to H&M. You go to different brands that you know, and you shop online. In China, you've got 90% of that, which actually goes through large marketplaces. And um, the marketplaces, basically, they're a virtual equivalent of, of a marketplace. They're just a place for buyers and sellers um, to come together, to meet each other, to, you know, to, to transact and, and um, to, um, to socialize, to do all the things that we used to do in, in these big marketplaces that we've had for hundreds and for thousands of years. There's always been marketplaces. So um, the largest marketplace by far in China um, belongs to Alibaba, and they have a couple different um, sites. The, um, the first one um, is Tmall. Now, Tmall is primarily for uh, established brands. So you will have people like Nestle, like Samsung, like Dyson, um, who are selling all sorts of products on Tmall. And there are a lot of brands, there are a lot of products. It's an absolutely gigantic site. Um, and the brands also come from all over the world, but there's a, quite a few Chinese and regional ones as well. And um, Tmall, it has a, the way it works is basically it charges an entry fee to the brand. It's a significant entry fee, but it's not, in, you know, it's not really very big for giant brands. Um, and then it charges a commission, so whatever sales, uh, it gets a cut. Um, but the thing that is really important, the reason why it even exists in some ways, is that for the Chinese market, it provides this really high visibility, really well-optimized, big traffic, um, mobile-fueled, social media-optimized marketplace, right? It's, what it basically has done is it's replaced um, all the brick-and-mortar infrastructure that hasn't had a chance to build up in China yet, and has created a digital equivalent. And so it is that important. It is, you know, it is part of everyday life. And so for major brands, including Apple, including a lot of North American brands, um, hosting a virtual storefront on Tmall, is, is, it's, it's a good alternative. It's in, some, in some ways, it's, it's the logical alternative to going and building thousands of stores to service all the various cities. Now, uh, that was Tmall, and so that was business to consumer, and that was large business to consumer. Um, the other site um, that has a huge amount of traffic is Taobao, and that is uh, consumer to consumer, and then it's also small business to consumer. So it's, it's kind of a little bit more comparable to eBay, but at the same time very different from eBay. Um, and one of the things that kind of distinguishes it is that it's not just products that people sell, it is also services. So you will encounter things like this, right? This is a fairly full-service looking travel agent mm -hmm. um, that operates on, um, on Taobao. And so, yes, they can sell you a package tour to Thailand, but what they can also do is handle your visa application, they can sell you a Thai SIM card, they can get you transportation from the airport. All of this is transacted on Taobao rather than um, going into a physical shop um, or, or, or an independent site, as you would probably find in North America or Germany or so on. And so, you know, you start to see this picture that kind of, again, kind of like the quote at the beginning, it becomes this amalgam of models that we have in the West as very separate companies that kind of get all blended into one. And Alibaba has kind of cherry-picked bits of the model that works for, for the various sites and the various properties. And you'll notice I've got PayPal on there, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Uh, what this means, though, to the Chinese, uh, the Chinese consumers is that you've got this whole family of sites that services almost every need that a person might have from the point of view of shopping. Um, and you can buy a huge range of goods. You can buy things that normally you might not have access to, including cars. There are car dealerships um, on Tmall. You Last time I checked, you could buy a Lamborghini on Tmall. Um, and you can also just buy you know, a cheap and cheerful car for the family. I mean, it's, it's a very different approach to, um, to selling things online. In some ways, it's whatever people might want, you put it online. And, and the customer expectations, um, therefore, shift with it, right? Um, now, you know, we've talked a lot about the big brands, but the other really important thing that, that these sites have done is they've enabled literally millions of jobs around the country, um, people from small villages, and they even have a term in China that Alibaba kind of likes to promote, which is a Taobao village. It's basically a village where the majority of the population is in some way occupied um, and earns a living in the Taobao supply chain. They either sell something, they make something that somebody else sells, they either 
do deliveries, they do something, right? And basically it creates all these jobs and a much larger marketplace than you would have, especially for someone who might be living quite far from the large cities, even though there are many, many large cities as we saw. Um, so one of the reasons that I'm talking about the Chinese marketplace model, uh, first of all, is because it's really interesting, uh, but also it, it, it goes beyond China. And what you see it is you see it in other countries that have a similar, um, similar circumstances, socioeconomic, um, in terms of infrastructure development, and so on, right? So in Africa, for example, you have Jumia, uh, and Jumia is actually, I think, uh, started with investment from um, Rocket Internet in Berlin, um, but is now a you know, big property that operates in Africa. And they have, they have a similar problem, right? The same kind of mathematics that we saw at the beginning. They've got in Lagos, you have three malls and you have 20 million inhabitants. And so what do you do? Well, you put stuff online. There's really almost no alternative, right? You just leapfrog completely over the idea of offline. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to build more shopping malls, but the population is there now. They want stuff, they need stuff. You just put it online. And in the case of Jumia, um, another really interesting example is you see the mobile influence, which you, you also see in China. They have uh, segments of their audience that not only do they only interact on mobile, but they only interact on messaging platforms. And in the case of, of, of Jumia, it sounded like it probably started ad hoc. Basically, the, um, the, the um, customers would just show up on social media and start trying to buy things. And then they probably formalized it into something where right now they actually have customer service agents who spend their days on things like Instagram and WhatsApp, and they actually transact. I mean, they go through the whole sales funnel, but through um, social media. And where they have formalized it, you will find other examples of the same pattern literally around the world, from South America to, to Bangkok, India, you name it, um, in, a, in a far more ad hoc sense, where you have any small business, um, whether they're making something or whether they're selling food on the street, who now has appropriated social, message, uh, social messaging, and in particular, uh, Facebook and WhatsApp, and you have other regional ones like Line in Thailand, for example, and they will use it to transact and to find customers. And it's just kind Kind of happened all on its own. So when you start to hear about conversational commerce, which is something that people are talking about a lot lately, and people like Facebook are trying to build in, I mean, the prototype really has been going on in Asia Pacific and in emerging economies for probably about three or four years now, just kind of all on its own, and, and also being formalized by larger companies. Um, so, of course, there's challenges with the marketplace model. One of the challenges um, is how do people still find stuff, right? I mean, a lot of the Chinese sites, they're heavily social fueled, and so they have all sorts of ways for people to find the products that they want. Um, but ultimately, they still are really big marketplaces. So, um, one of the interesting things that's emerged in China and um, is something that I've I've seen translated in English anyways as an online shopping neighborhood. And what, the way you want to conceptualize one of these is you could take something like a Pinterest, so it's a user-generated, curated content site, and then you mix it together with something like a travel aggregator, so like a Skyscanner in Europe or a Kayak in North America, and you munge it all together. And what you basically get are consumers, they open an account and they start collecting things that they like, they make little collections, the sites are really highly social, so they get followers, they have conversations and so on. And then um, all of these products that they've, they've pinned and they've collected, um, ultimately, if you click on one of them, you actually go to a site where you can potentially purchase it. And in China, it's actually fairly convenient that a lot of these will either end up on Taobao or Tmall. So it's one of the reasons the model has worked. But then the, the site that actually owns this aggregation service, they actually get a cut for every outbound click, the way someone like Kayak would get paid by the airlines if you click to go buy something. And, you know, to the tune of, I think it was 6 million clicks a day in 2012, for this site alone, that's a lot of clicks. And you know, a lot of these models, maybe they're experimental, some of them will work, some of them won't. Um, but they also show something that happens in China very often, which is when they start these products, monetization is always kind of there from, from day one. They might not always get it right right away, but the monetization is always there, whereas something like a Pinterest would have built up first this huge audience, and then they start figuring out ways to plug in, um, ways to make money on it. So it's a very different approach. Um, one of the reasons, also, there's a lot of reasons that kind of concatenate, but this is what makes it interesting and also makes it useful from a business perspective, is understanding what these characteristics are that came together. Um, so one is social, right? So, I mean, social media messaging is huge, and it's particularly huge in America, 
emerging economies. And there's this weird relationship that it has with mobile. So I will explain the complicated chart. So you've got the axis, um, the horizontal one is internet penetration. So over on the right, you've got those same countries we saw at the beginning, North America, you've got Europe, Japan, Korea, Australia, Singapore, and um, they all have high internet penetration. And then they have, you know, varying levels of social media use. Some of them are lagging, other ones aren't. And then you look over on the other side and you have very low internet penetration right, India, um, Indonesia, Brazil, and so on, but the social media use is like completely crazy. And that seems to be a pattern just about everywhere. And a lot of people, they will go to a shop and they will buy a mobile phone. And they literally, some of them don't even say, I'm coming to the shop to buy the mobile phone. They'll come in and they will say, I want WhatsApp, I want Facebook, translated as, I want a device to allow me to use the service. And a lot of times they will actually leave the shop with the services already installed by the shopkeeper, the account set up, and away you go. And so it just ends up being, um, basically, it's the first point of access to the internet, as well as being uh, you know, the first thing they do on their mobile device. So this creates all these you know, effects where social media ends up fueling a lot of things. Um, and this is a map of the social media landscape in China. I've seen different versions over the years and they change slightly. But, you know, there's a lot of services. There's probably quite a few more when you look at all the different verticals than there are in, um, in the West, where there's big dominant companies. There's a lot more slices. And a characteristic of the Chinese sites uh, ends up being very often that rather than being sites, they are some sort of kind of formalized platform. And some of them will be smaller platforms and then others will be much larger. And um, the really interesting one that everyone always talks about and has been interesting for a few years um, is WeChat. Now, uh, WeChat is mobile only. There isn't really a desktop version. There's a rudimentary chat client, I think, that they've kind of chucked up there. But really, it, you, know, you use it on mobile, that's it. The site's only about five years old. They've got more than 700 million monthly active users. And if I recall correctly, their average revenue per user is something like seven or eight dollars, um, which is really, really high. And uh, part of it is that, again, rather than just being a social site, and you know, they offer all the usual social stuff. You can chat, you can do voice chat, you can do little micro blog type stuff. Um, but the really interesting stuff is the three at the bottom, right? So you've got a highly customizable API, you have a payment platform, and a virtual wallet. And this has created an environment that starts to feel more like an operating system, because you can do all sorts of things in it, um, but then you can actually really do things in it. You can shop, you can do all sorts of stuff. Uh, you can basically live your life through it in many ways. Um, and just to give you an idea of how it works, so um, over, on the <laughs> over on the left, you have some sites or some brands that I followed. And when you click on one of these, you enter their little area, and um, the API and the platform is such that Brands can actually create kind of a microsite inside of WeChat. So there, you'll see at the bottom, there's kind of the equivalent of top-level navigation for this Uniqlo site in the middle there. And then you have menus that open up. So you can have lots of layers of information. It kind of feels like a small site. And uh, you can drill, you know, drill down into it. Some of them have at whole shopping carts and things in there. Um, what you also have is a chat component. And the chat component, I mean, you know, some of it is bots. Some of it is customer service people who are actually actively chatting. Um, so it goes from being quite rudimentary to actually having more interactions with people. But underpinning all of this is at any point, if somebody wants to buy something, they often can. Because it's about, out of that 700 odd million people, you've got about half of them, I think, from what I recall at the moment, um, that have a digital wallet already set up. So their bank account um, is linked to WeChat. And so um, almost any opportunity, you can transact, you can you know, micro payments for a game, you can make a larger purchase, uh, you can use it as a payment platform for all sorts of stuff, including, you know, go out on the street in China and you buy some fruit, your vendor might ask you to pay for it in we on WeChat, um, even though it's not at all in a digital context, and that's, that's really quite normal. Um, the other really interesting thing, and we're starting to see shades of this in, in Facebook lately, um, is that there's something that emerged um, that they called light apps. And um, they actually just, two or three days ago, they actually formalized it into an actual kind of platform API thing. And the, way they, the reason they use these is so you've got the, the infrastructure level that WeChat has provided, which is very formalized, allows you to do a lot of stuff, but it is still formal components and things that fit together. But because we're talking commerce, brands want to do interesting stuff 
they want to engage people, they want to have little micro experiences. And so people have been building these light apps, which are basically really rich HTML, and they use that kind of as the glue layer. It either, you know, you might be on the street and you scan a QR code and it brings you into one of these, and then from there you go into WeChat and then you do something, and then maybe um, you even get a QR code at the end, and then you go back out into the real world and you do something with that. And so it's, it's created this platform that's actually really, really robust and you can do a lot with. And um, I think this quote is probably says it the best that I've seen in a while, and it's from an analyst in the U.S. Um, and you know, philosophically, Facebook has been all about growing numbers of users and getting a big audience and so on. And only recently have they started kind of doing more with the platform, other than the base advertising level that they've had for a while. But in the case of WeChat, it was more about addressing the needs of people daily, hourly, monthly, and that social was part of it, but social was not the only reason that the site existed. Um, and that, so that fundamentally changes you know, why it's there and how it works. Um, so we talked about virtual wallets, and here we've got another factor that kind of comes in. One of, the region, uh, one of the reasons that virtual wallets have been popular in China is the same reason that they've been popular in other countries as well. Um, in emerging economies, you have a lot of people who don't have a bank account. They're considered unbanked is the term. And so they also, of course, don't have a credit card. And so, you know, how do you do e-commerce without credit cards? Kind of, it's the way it works usually. Um, so there's all sorts of workarounds that have emerged. Digital wallets are one of them. Um, you have also a lot of uh, virtual currencies and virtual banking. The the one you've probably heard of is M-Pesa, um, that's been in Kenya for quite some time. It's a whole mobile banking system that works entirely on a phone, and people use it for absolutely everything. But there are several hundred of these similar things dotted around the world in different capacities. Um, another really common thing that's still happening a lot in emerging economies is people will actually pay cash on delivery. Um, they just don't pay for the product until it arrives at their door, which, which existed in North America and probably Europe, you know, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, I think I remember it when I was a child, you could still do it, but it's been gone for a while. It's not really something we do, but there it still works because it fills that need. People, you know, need to pay, but they just don't have another method to do it if there's no virtual currency they can use. Um, and in different markets, it ends up being different stuff, right? So this is uh, Jumia in Kenya again, and there people have M-Pesa, so they take M-Pesa at the door. In other places, they might take mobile airtime credits as, as money, that are, and in China, it would probably be WeChat, um, or it might be Alipay, which is the other thing that um, I alluded to at the beginning. Um, so Alibaba, with its big site, also has a payment platform that started off really small just for vendors and people to transact, and then has turned into a big platform Form. So you can now use Alipay to pay for all sorts of things in China as well. So you start to see all these platforms that really add this richness to the ecosystem that we don't necessarily have it at this point, or we're starting to have. So mobile is really kind of the glue, right, that links all of this stuff together, um, and it enables these ecosystems to really work. Uh, uh, in the case of WeChat, and I mentioned this briefly before, you know, QR codes are absolutely integral, and, and so they're integral to mobile as well. I mean, everyone has a scanner with them on their phone, and um, the way WeChat works is uh, anyone who opens an account, whether it's a brand or whether it's a person, they get their own personalized QR code, and that becomes the mechanism for people to follow you. And in China, you'll see it on business cards everywhere, you'll see in shop windows and you can just walk down the street and just scan and you end up following that brand. So it's a really easy way to get on board with each, each brand or just to follow a person. Uh, and you're start, we're starting to see that in Facebook now has uh, a modified QR code that they've, unfortunately they didn't choose QR codes, they made their own. Um, so there's, Facebook has one, Snapchat has one now. So they're starting to um, show up in the West as well, but um, this is really one of the things that made things really work in China. And um, also in, in China, one of the things they, they've done fairly early on was that QR code readers are included in almost every app, because it's almost like QR codes are part of the currency, right? So you can't use the code if you don't have a reader, so you just put a reader everywhere. And that way, almost any product can start to leverage QR codes in some way, and you just the entire population feels comfortable doing it. Um, and again, so just putting all those little pieces of infrastructure in, backfilling that infrastructure in different ways. Um, and so, as a result, as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, using a QR code to transact, it's just become kind of normal. Certainly in China, it's very normal, and there's all sorts of other parts of Asia Pacific where it's used in varying degrees. I mean, it's certainly stronger in APAC than uh, most of the rest of the world. So, 
what we end up with is uh, basically a generation of consumers that's growing up, not just in China, but in a lot of countries where there's a lot of leapfrogging going on, right? So they're not just leapfrogging the desktop for mobile and not just leapfrogging finance necessarily or the whole physical retail thing that we're used to. They kind of end up kind of living in this big rapid prototype of what our future will probably be. You know, I mean, you know, I've been following uh, trends in Asia for about 15 years now. And there's a lot of things you can learn from looking um, at these other markets because some of them are consistently ahead of us all the time. And it's just simply because of the circumstance. Um, and sometimes it's called, again, sometimes it's cultural, but a lot of times it's infrastructural. It has to do with rapid growth. It has to do with all these things put together. And they end up being able to try things at a scale that we are just kind of coming to terms with because we've got all these legacy systems and credit card companies and things we have to negotiate with, and they just go and they build it, and they throw it out there, and millions of people use it, and then sometimes, you know, people slow, to slow it down and say, okay, we have to figure out how to make this work as a larger thing. But so there's a lot more prototyping so much more quickly with bigger audiences. And so from an audience perspective, you know, the idea of online, offline, mobile, it kind of all blurs together, right? Uh, in some ways, it's kind of irrelevant. It's all basically the platform that you live your life through. And I'll give you one last example, and this is from a brand perspective. Uh, you know, in these markets, I'm not saying that you can go and just try absolutely everything, but it enables you to try things that you really couldn't necessarily try back home. So this is an example from um, La Moda in Russia. And so they had similar circumstances that we've mentioned with some of these other markets. They have poor postal infrastructure and they have people who pay on delivery. And so they thought, okay, well, how can we put this together in a creative way to get more business? And so what they do is they have a fleet of delivery people who actually come to the house um, because they can't trust the postal service. And the delivery people will show up with the goods and then they will wait and somebody goes in, tries the stuff on. If it doesn't fit, you can return it at the door. Um, if you've bought several of them, you can try a few, and then you can pick the right size. Uh, and then, you know, if there's a payment or a return or whatever, you just process it on the spot. And when I first heard about this, it was about three years ago, and I thought, oh, this is so cool, um, but it's never going to work, right? I mean, a year from now or six months from now, I'm going to have to get rid of this slide and never talk about it again because it's not going to work. And uh, since then, I've heard that it's relatively popular in China. Um, they apparently call it a mobile fitting room. Um, and then Jumia, that we discussed, actively uses it in Africa right now. And there they have slightly different circumstances. They have um, the commerce infrastructure is a little bit, um, a little bit uh, newer, so a lot of customers, they order wrong sizes is one of their problems. So they say to people, order three or four, doesn't matter, and we bring them to your door, you try them on, and you keep the one that actually fits. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of creativity, but part of it is understanding what the market conditions are and also why there's all these differences. And it's that whole really neat mix of culture, economics, infrastructure, and you put it all together. And I will leave you with one last quote, um, which is from The Economist, and which, to Westerners, mobile banking is a new way of doing something old, but to many Africans, it's just the obvious way to do something new. And thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. It was very insightful. Cool. You just, uh, I just couldn't finish my tweet on, <laughs> on this old Twitter platform where you can do nothing but <laughs> just send out texts but um, by, by explaining how this, this clothing platform works. Um, first, my first question, you have to, we have to skip back. What is a closet anthropologist? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you go um, into a closet and... No, I mean, it's, it's, it's my phrase for the fact that I'm not officially an anthropologist, okay. but... Um, it's, it's a lot of what I do is um, ethnographic research, and I'm really interested in the, the cultural and socio-cultural roots of why people do what they do, and it just okay, ends let's, up... Okay, let's, let's forget these titles. <laughs> um, but what I really want to know is, having seen all these services and mm -hmm. platforms, why is there, isn't there anything in Europe or in the central US like this? I mean, a lot of times... Um, you could probably, a lot of it has to do with uh, what I'll loosely call baggage. I mean, we have, we have a lot of history, mm -hmm. and some of this history has to do with things that work really well. Other things don't work so well, but they're not necessarily always easy to just turn off and try something new. Um, and it's, you know, you often have to pitch it to people, and there's always all these vested interests. You know, you have the banking se sector that doesn't want to change, or you have retail that's maybe being forced to change, but they still have to change. And so, and, you know, there, in a lot of these countries, I mean, it's all happening all at the same time. So you pick the stuff that works, 
works, you try, you put things together. If they don't work, you chuck it out, you do something else. And inevitably, you end up with something very different. But it's because you're building it kind of, you're, all, you're rapid prototyping the whole thing. But is it, is it another way of dealing with things, another cultural mm. approach? Not to hang on things that have been built and that right. have been proved to, to be useful or to be working? Th that's a good question. I don't really know. Um, because, again, we have things to hang on to, and there's a lot in, in, there are many less things to hang on to in a lot of these markets, because literally, I mean, the cities, some of the cities didn't exist three years ago, right, mm -hmm. in the size that they are. So it is literally just building up, and then often things get built up, and then they'll get torn down and put something else. And so, you, you know, if you live in an environment of constant change, maybe you're, you're, you're less, you worry less about change, for one, or maybe it's your reality, whereas here, change, you know, change is stressful, right? Um, But, you know, 30, 50 years from now, when those markets are, are potentially more, what we'll loosely call st stable, in terms of having this infrastructure and everything, maybe they'll have the same problem that we have right now. It's, we won't know until it happens. Apple is moving into this WeChat thing right now with the uh, update to iOS 10, yes. where you can see where you can install apps into your iMessenger. Yeah, I mean, they've got a... The, Apple has taken a completely different approach than everybody else at this point with theirs, because they're not... It's kind of hard to explain how Apple's apps are. They are literally, the apps are almost like these tiny applications that you can share in an active conversation, which mm -hmm. no one else is really doing. Everyone else is building services that live in the environment. And you have one user, one service, and the user talks back and forth to service, and the service does something, and that's it. Apple, it's almost like, give me a little you know, TripAdvisor application, and I can take it, and I can insert it into my conversation with you, and then we can both look at content, and then we can you know, do something with it. It's, It's kind of flipping it upside down in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, and they're just starting, so it'll be interesting to see how it works out. It's, it's a really neat concept. It, just, it is it's very different. It literally kind of turns everything the other way. Um, Who tried this? Who tried installing these apps into his iMessenger? I haven't done so, I admit. There aren't very many of them right now. Yeah, there's some to pay stuff. There is an app called Budget or something where you can say I have a budget, we mm. share a budget of 100 bucks or something, right. and if you spend something, it gets, uh, they, they, uh, it's, it's, it's diminished. So nobody has tried it yet? Okay, we should try it this afternoon, <laughs> maybe, together. Okay, any more questions for Stephanie? Maybe from the audience. There was one question. Please introduce yourself. Good morning. Um, I noticed that your slides are comparatively um, um, well, they have frightening old years, so it seems like um, things I'm completely unaware of, um, you have noticed in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do a lot of research. So you're telling us old stuff. Uh, well, it's, it's not. <laughs> in the th The thing is, I, I, I update the presentation probably every three or four months because I, I give this presentation a lot. People really mm -hmm. want to hear this. And so I'm constantly kind of checking that it hasn't really changed. Um, and if it has, you know, why and how and is it relevant and so on. Um, but it has. A lot of this has been going on for, for a while now. It's just, it's, um, it's hard to see if you're over here. You, I mean, we've been going to Asia Pacific on an annual basis for about 15 years. So part of that's the reason that I started noticing this sooner. Um, but it's also challenging because the language Languages are different, and um, and there's a lot of cultural stuff to get your head around. So, um, but I think it's it's really valuable because it really does show, um, first of all, just completely different ways of doing things that are actually working. You know, mm -hmm. we were in a panel yesterday, and someone was talking about what will we do when advertising doesn't work anymore. And in in China, for example, a lot of the advertising has just been replaced by different models. They just well, not replaced in some ways. It didn't work, so they just did something else. And so you have micropayments. You have all sorts of lots of different environments and ways that people um, find ways of getting money from an interaction that doesn't involve an ad. You hold onto the microphone. Do you have another question? Well, basically, I went. Um, it seems like something really big must be now a huge, because it was big in 2012. 2012. I don't know. That's like a century ago. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, I guess it is. Um, th th there's also a lot of change. I mean, all the brands that I'm mentioning, and certainly you know, WeChat, Alibaba, they are definitely huge. I mean, there's no other way to, to, to put it, really. Um, some of the other ones, you know, they weave in and out. Some things are less popular. Others might band together and change. But um, they're all, the models are still pretty much all there. And they're just uh, finding new ways and, and evolving it. And I'm sure some of them will fail. Some of them might turn out not to work in the long term. Maybe they work for a few years. And, and then it just kind of morphs into something else. 
Okay, thank you. We have to move on. Thank you, Stephanie, <laughs> for being here and these you. insights. <laughs>